So good, good afternoon and a, and a very warm uh, welcome to everyone to today, today's very important discussion, uh, the event towards a childhood free from unhealthy food marketing, uh, exploring the next phase between now and the next hour and a half. So my name is Nikolai from the uh, European Public Health Alliance, and I will do my very best to ensure a smooth running of the discussion uh, today. And of course, with the support of a whole team who is actually doing uh, the real work behind the screens. Um, I'm very pleased with the interest uh, in the discussion. There's really over 100, uh, 300 registrations and with even more with the fantastic lineup of speakers um, that, and panelists that we have today. Uh, now, before we go into the actual topic of the day, some of the usual organizational matters. Uh, most of us are familiar with those by now, uh, but nonetheless, um, I, I guess they need to be restated. Uh, so for next slide, please. So uh, first of all, the event is uh, being recorded. And if all goes well, we should make it available uh, after the event. A brief uh, report will also be prepared. So second, we really look forward to your questions, comments, inputs. So please use the uh, Q&A uh, section for that. We will try to group um, your inputs and select some of the most pertinent questions out there and put them to speakers. And we really hope that you come with as much input as possible to this important discussion. Um, and if your question hasn't been answered, don't worry, this is not the last moment we'll be addressing um, this, this topic. And so any insights we may gather from you will be critical for our future work on this. Now, thirdly, please engage uh, through social media. We have the following hashtags, which you can see, <clears throat> which you can see on screen. And if you follow the IFA at EU handle, um, you will see them coming by as well. And uh, last, please uh, do not hesitate to reach out af after the event and follow up. Uh, because again, this is not at all the end of the discussion. In many ways, it is a continuation. And in actually, in some ways, really a kind of a new beginning um, of this uh, debate, at least here at the European level. Next slide, please. Now, with uh, the organizational questions out of the way, we go into the substance now, and we as you can see, we have a very full, very exciting program uh, and lineup of speakers. And uh, it, it's kind of divided in two sections, uh, you could say. One will really be describing the issues around marketing, especially how it affects young people's health and rights, uh, as, well as, as well as the solutions that, that are on the table, which will be followed by a Q&A discussion session. And in the second session, we will hear from different societal perspectives why uh, effectively tackling marketing is actually so crucial. So next slide. And um, just to highlight the context, this, this event is not only a discussion, but also an important moment where we uh, launch two key documents uh, that have been in the making for quite a while now. The first of them is a call to action to protect children from the marketing of nutritionally poor food, uh, supported by 20 of the key European health, medical, consumer, child, family organizations. Uh, you can see them on the screen. And second, to substantiate this call is essentially a blueprint food marketing direct directive, which shows in legal terms how EU can use its power to effectively regulate cross-border marketing. And that both the directive and the call are closely linked. And the main points will, of them will be discussed today. And you will also receive them after the event. Next slide. Um, as a final uh, scene setter in a way, it is really kind of important to mention that both climate change, which is of course really on the agenda now, and the predatory commercial practices of which uh, unhealthy food marketing in relation to, to children and young people is really a core part. Both these have been identified as key threats to young people's health, well-being, and rights. In brief, you could say a common future. And today's moment with the uh, crucial COP26 ongoing, of course, it really brings also these two strands together, climate marketing. 
And I must say, unfortunately, despite many promises we've seen, declarations, we're not uh, yet there to tackle really either of both. But there's hope and expectations that we are going to move forward. And uh, especially also in view of the recently adopted um, declaration by the European Parliament, which really makes a strong statement on marketing. And this is really one of the elements that we need to work further towards. And I think uh, to which this initiative come, really comes um, at the right time to contribute. Now, as we mentioned the European Parliament, it's uh, a good opportunity to give the word to our first speaker, uh, who will give uh, some of the opening reflections. Uh, Sarah Wiener, member of European Parliament. Many of you will know her as being deeply engaged on food in all its different aspects. Uh, Ms. Wiener, the floor is to you. Thank you, Nikolai. Good afternoon, everyone. Firstly, thank you very much for inviting me to be part of today's discussion on marketing on unhealthy food to children. I really, it really is a great honor for me to be here as children's nutrition has been a key issue in my work as a chef for many years. In fact, 14 years ago, I created a foundation in Germany that aims to bring food closer to children by teaching them to cook, but also by taking them to farms and showing them close up where their food comes from. This is extremely important because an increasing number of people no longer cook at home with fresh ingredients, even though this is the healthiest way of preparing food. This also has long-term effects on children who may never learn how to prepare food themselves. However, it is in those very first years of life that we lay the foundations for developing a healthy relationship with food, which becomes the very basis for a healthy development throughout childhood and adolescence. It is obvious that we are failing to build such a healthy foundation for many children today. It is no coincidence that health issues related to nutrition already affect many children in Europe. One in three children in the EU aged between six and nine is overweight or obese. And an increasing number of children develop other food-related health issues and chronic diseases such as type two diabetes and inflammations, while they are also at an ever higher risk of developing cancer and cardiovascular disease. So it's clear that we need to act urgently to reverse these figures and ensure a healthy future for our children. One extremely important aspect of this and the topic of today's conversation is the marketing of nutritionally poor food to children. In particular, it is highly problematic that the waste majority of foods marketed to, towards children are actually unhealthier than those marketed to adults. For instance, Studies by organizations like the Max Rubner Institute in Germany and Foodwatch have shown that products marketed towards children contain more sugar than those marketed to adults. Popular examples for this would be yogurts and breakfast cereals. This is extremely dangerous and this manipulates children's perception of food as they get used to and dependent on overly sweet flavors and by replacing natural flavors with artificial ones. Yet, children are exposed to adverts for such products on a daily basis. In addition, companies often use manipulative techniques to make their products more attractive to children, such as comics and anima anima animations, animals and toys, or other giveaways. In general, the pervasive nature of such advertising such, suggests to children that eating ultra-processed snacks or fast food and drinking sugar-laden soft drinks is much more natural than choosing fruit, vegetables, and water. Or have you ever seen in adverts on TV or any other media telling kids to eat an apple? I would be surprised if anyone here has. Unfortunately, regulating the advertising market is, in this sector has been far from successful and relied heavily on voluntary measures. However, voluntary measures 
have not helped to decrease the number of adverts for unhealthy food children are exposed to. That is why I think today's discussion and the launch of the call to action and the blueprint directive on prote uh, protecting children from the marketing on unhealthy food could hardly be any more timely. The EU can and must play a lead role in the fight against poor nutrition and this initiative clearly show it could do so. For example, by setting clear boundaries on what type of advertising can the be run on digital and broadcast media and when or by banning the use of marketing techniques they are specifically targeted at children. I truly hope that policymakers in the EU and particularly the Commission will pay close attention to today's discussion and soon present proposals that will truly protect children. We need measures that enable and empower citizens and children to prepare food and cook with fresh ingredients rather than letting them fall into the traps of the food industry that bakes them with ultra processed cheap food packages in bright colors and marketed with failed promises. I'm sure we will hear much more about what we can do about this issue in the later interventions. So I'm certainly looking forward for this, to this discussion. Thank you again for inviting me to speak here today. Thank you so much, uh, Sara, for these words of support. And indeed, as you say, marketing makes it really hard to instill this kind of healthy eating culture with children, which is essentially just the world upside down. It's, it's really not, not the way things should look like. And we very much look forward to work with you uh, in your role on improving food marketing environment, the food environments more generally, and really to push um, the EU agenda on this. Thank you so much. And I very much look forward to stay, stay in touch uh, with you on this. Um, I hope our, so. I, I really too, <laughs> very much. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker, uh, Joe Jewell from UNICEF, um, and I think well, there, there's really few people uh, better placed and, and more knowledgeable uh, to speak about this critical intersection between child health, child rights, and marketing. And we'll be hearing more from that now. So Joe, uh, the floor is yours. Um, please, uh, if we can have the presentation up. Thank you very much, Nikolai, and thank you to the European Public Health Alliance for the invitation, and thanks also to the esteemed member of the European Parliament for those powerful opening remarks, which really um, set the tone for this important meeting today. Um, in my presentation, I want to just give a, a relatively high-level overview of um, why UNICEF considered this to be an absolute priority um, in ensuring ch children's rights to, to nutrition and health, um, and why we stand side by side with colleagues at the World Health Organization in advocating for um, stronger action to protect children from the harmful marketing uh, of unhealthy foods. Um, I will be framing my intervention um, from a child rights approach and hoping that it does set the scene for uh, subsequent speakers who will go into some of the, the more detail. Um, I just want to start with acknowledgements to, to colleagues who have helped uh, in the preparation of these slides, um, Kathy Schatz from my, our team here in UNICEF, and also Katrin Engelhart um, from WHO, who I work very closely with on this topic. Next slide, please. So in terms of what I would like to cover in this presentation, um, really just a little bit of high level background to why it's an important issue and what is, are the existing global recommendations, which I have to say have existed for quite some time, um, but we always reiterate that they need to be implemented and uh, without implementing them, we will not uh, make progress in this area. As I mentioned, I will then introduce why we come at it from a child rights approach and what, is, what that can mean in terms of empowering governments to take action to protect children's rights, um, and then move into some of the, the sort of content aspects regarding what it means to introduce a comprehensive approach, why that's important, and also what are some of the effective elements in existing policies that um, can inspire uh, action at the European level. Finally, talking about opposition, and I know that other speakers will um, touch on that most likely, and then I'll come to uh, some concluding remarks. Next slide, please. So um, in terms of um, why this is an important issue, I mean, 
first and foremostly, it is an issue um, of children's rights, and I will come to that later. But why is it getting the attention um, so increasingly at this moment in time? Well, primarily because children are not getting uh, nutritionally uh, sound diets. They're not eating uh, quality diets. They're eating too much unhealthy food. And this is contributing to a global rise in overweight and obesity. And combined unhealthy diets, overweight and obesity, and the diet-related non-communicable diseases are becoming a leading cause of death and disability globally. And what is driving these uh, trends? Primarily, we understand that these are driven by what we call unhealthy food environments or otherwise uh, obesogenic food environments. And the way in which foods are marketed are an important part of um, the unhealthy food environment. And we know that they play a critical role in influencing children's diets. There is unequivocal evidence um, set out in global recommendations that marketing of unhealthy food has an impact on children's behaviors, their diets, and their risk of becoming overweight um, or obesity. And we know from many studies, including those that uh, the previous speaker highlighted, that children are highly exposed to uh, marketing uh, for food and non-alcoholic beverages. Uh, this uses um, very powerful persuasive techniques and it is overwhelmingly for unhealthy foods. Next slide, please. This is why um, the uh, WHO in 2010 introduced uh, a set of recommendations on the marketing of um, food and non-alcoholic beverages to children, which was uh, adopted by the World Health Assembly um, and called on uh, countries to take the necessary steps to implement the set of recommendations. This was followed in 2012 by a framework for implementing the set of recommendations, which set out in granular detail ways in which um, member states could follow the recommendations and implement effective um, policies. However, in 2016, the WHO Commission on Ending Childhood Obesity again highlighted the issue of unhealthy food marketing to children, the fact that it continues to be very widespread, but uh, noted with regret um, that member states continue to fail to give significant attention to this issue uh, and not adopting the necessary policies and requested that they address this issue um, with greater attention. Next slide, please. So how can um, a child rights approach uh, help uh, advance this agenda? Well, first and foremost, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which is the most, one of the most widespread adopted conventions in the world, obliges state parties to ensure that children's rights are respected, protected and fulfilled. And this includes restricting commercial activities that infringe on children's rights, including, for example, uh, food marketing. The Committee on the Rights of the Child, which is the independent body of experts tasked with monitoring compliance with the CRC, has noted with regret that the food industry spends billions of dollars on persistent and pervasive marketing strategies that promote unhealthy foods to children and have called on such marketing to be regulated. Next slide, please. We know that food marketing negatively affects many of the rights enshrined in the uh, CRC, including, as mentioned previously, health, adequate nutrition, but also increasingly relevant in the digital area, uh, privacy and freedom from exploitation. In all actions um, concerning children, the CRC calls for putting the uh, interests of children first, which we know as the best interest of the child, and that in all actions concerning them, the, their best interest shall be the primary consideration. It's worth reminding everybody that when, when it comes to children's rights, children are rights holders and that governments are duty bearers. So it's governments that should use their regulatory power to implement evidence-based policies and evidence-based interventions. Next slide, please. So what do we mean when we're calling for um, a child rights approach? Um, and what do we mean by a comprehensive approach to protect children? Well, given that um, the impact of food marketing and perhaps uh, subsequent speakers will talk about this is a function of both exposure and power. So the amount of marketing that children see and also the persuasive techniques that I've mentioned, we really need to be addressing both of those elements uh, when it comes to um, implementing policies that are, are gonna be effective. So um, we also need to look at a broad definition of what are the marketing types, techniques and channels that are restricted. And the WHO has a very useful definition in the WHO set of recommendations that refers to all forms of commercial communication. And I think one, that is a perfect 
point worth dwelling on that some of the existing regulations that we have, whilst you know containing elements of good practice, are rarely comprehensive um, to achieve that um, or align with that definition that WHO has adopted. Thirdly, it should always put the interests of all children first, and it's worth dwelling on this point as UNICEF to mention that all children under the age of 18 um, are considered to be children and therefore our recommendation is that um, policies should cover all children up to the age of 18. Finally, we need to define the foods to be restricted based on independent evidence-based criteria such as those adopted by the WHO uh, regions, including the WHO Regional Office for Europe. Next slide, please. So whilst it is regrettable that we don't have uh, an example um, in law of a gold standard around the world, what we do know is that there are effective elements in existing policies adopted by governments which show that if you combine them, we would be um, moving down the road to a more comprehensive and a highly effective approach. First of all, as I mentioned, the importance of protecting all children up to the age of 18 adopting a broad definition of marketing to children. So for example, Chile's food labeling and advertising law includes a ban on advertising for unhealthy foods that is considered to be child targeted, where the audience comprises children um, and where the advertising appeals to children by including characters, toys, or other strategies. In addition, it was updated to include a time-based uh, restriction. So in combining these elements, uh, the law has actually been able to um, adopt a broad definition of what is considered marketing to children. Again, the importance of a broad set of marketing communications channels, for example, the Quebec uh, Consumer Protection Act covers any commercial advertising directed at children on television, radio, print, internet, mobile phones, and signage, as well as the use of um, promotional items. Covering a broad set, set of persuasive techniques that appeal to children is also extremely important. So here we're talking about the use of real or fictional characters, gifts, prizes, or any other benefits that may encourage uh, purchase or consumption of a food. I've mentioned the importance of applying a strict nutrient profile model such as that adopted by uh, the WHO regions. And finally, adopting an effective enforcement mechanism that has teeth. So that, that may be, uh, for example, filing criminal procedures against the actors, fines that can be levied on the, the actor um, any, at any point of the, the marketing cycle from conception to its distribution so that the policy um, will be enforced. Finally, we know, next slide please, um, with regards to countering opposition, we know that um, governments that introduce this and advocates who call for these policies do face um, opposition from um, certain political opponents, but perhaps also um, those who are producing, manufacturing and marketing unhealthy food. Um, and so we need to be smart about how we overcome um, common arguments. One of them is a reg regarding, um, you know, this is not the role of government and it's parents and caregivers that should be responsible for this. But we know, for example, that marketing negatively influences children's food values and preferences and that we need, therefore, um, government action um, to avoid undermining the efforts of parents and other caregivers. Um, there will also be challenges around the, the level of evidence um, regarding um, the impact of marketing, particularly on overweight and obesity, but we know that there is a large and consistent body of evidence that has determined that it has a negative impact on, on children um, and that this is on a causal pathway to, to weight gain. Um, further, there will be a call for um, self-regulation to be introduced rather than effective government regulation, but we have many examples from within Europe, but also abroad that voluntary action is, is largely ineffective and we can pull that evidence together. Um, the, uh, the stepwise approach would be more effective than a comprehensive approach, but regrettably over the years, since the WHO set of recommendations was developed, we know that actually a stepwise approach can include too many loopholes and therefore actually can squeeze and encourage marketing to shift to unregulated times, inadvertently increasing marketing in some instances. Finally, they may argue that marketing restrictions are unlawful, but we know using a child rights-based approach um, and many other uh, mandates that uh, you can and should introduce regulations in this space. So moving on to my final slides and conclusions, I think my point that I want to get over here is that uh, using the law uh, and policy to regulate um, food environments is increasingly important because we know that self-regulation has a little positive effect in this space. 
Um, we believe uh, as UNICEF that restrictions on food marketing are a necessary step in order to improve children's diets and help prevent overweight and obesity. Um, as just demonstrated, there are strategies to overcome opposition and without taking action, uh, we risk violating many children's rights. So um, I hope uh, with this presentation that I've set the scene for an interesting discussion and uh, thank you for the invitation to be here today. Thank you so very, very much, uh, Joe. Uh, really clear, a clear presentation, clear recommendations. And it's really powerful how when you stress children as being right holders and governments as duty bearers, you really put a whole different taste uh, to the relationships between, uh, between these two. And, um, and, and also really uh, thank you for, for stressing uh, the evidence around market marketing and the importance of the legislative approaches which this initiative is really about, um, and that it's really based on the firm evidence uh, indeed. Um, thank you so much. And we are moving straight away to the next speaker, Amandine Garde, Professor of European Law uh, at the University of Liverpool at the NCD unit. And Amandine is the main author of the Blueprint Directive that uh, is being uh, made public and launched today. And Amandine will give a quick overview of what the directive contains um, and why we, were, we, we actually um, uh, have been, um, have been Push to introduce uh, to introduce this. So, Amandine, uh, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much, Nikolai, and a very warm welcome to uh, all participants. Uh, I'm proposing indeed to reflect on what Joe has said in an EU-specific context, and I will briefly introduce the rationale for and key provisions of the draft directive that we're launching today. So, next slide, please. The European Union has recognized the marketing of unhealthy food as a major public health concern for over 15 years, ever since its 2005 Obesity Prevention Green Paper. Landmarks have included the 2007 Obesity Prevention White Paper, the 2014 EU Childhood Obesity Action Plan, and the 2006 Regulation on nutrition and health claims made on foods. In 2007, the EU adopted the Audiovisual Media Services Directive, which was then amended in 2018. An implementation report is expected from the Commission in 2022, as also was mentioned in the 2021 Europe's Beating Cancer Plan. Now, more recently, the European Union has also acknowledged that the marketing of unhealthy food has significant implications for children's rights. This is explicit in both the 2017 Maltese Council Presidency conclusions on child overweight and obesity, and even more so in the 2018 Bulgarian conclusions on healthy nutrition for children. Even more recently, the 2021 EU strategy on the rights of the child explicitly refers to child nutrition and food marketing more specifically. However, and regrettably, EU rhetoric has not yet translated into the adoption and implementation of effective regulatory frameworks. Next slide, please. No step to date has been taken towards the comprehensive approach that Joe has mentioned and that independent experts on food marketing are calling for alongside the um, uh, civil society organizations operating in the EU and beyond in this field. And this is despite years of EU level uh, advocacy to bring evidence to bear on the EU's response to the problem that it has itself identified. Yes, the 2018 amendments to the Audiovisual Media Services Directive explicitly states that children's exposure to unhealthy food marketing should be effectively reduced. Nevertheless, the EU still relies on a wholly inadequate system based on the adoption of codes of conduct 
and the exchange of best practice to achieve this objective. And you, we've just heard from Joe that there is no best practice to exchange. As a colleague once said vividly, you do not put Dracula in charge of a blood bank. Similarly, you should not put the industries that make enormous profits in promoting unhealthy food at great cost to child health and child rights in charge of regulating such marketing. This seems common sense. Now, leaving aside the measure conflicts of interest that such an approach entails, it is clear that self-regulatory rules in the EU have pro proven largely insufficient to reduce the um, exposure of children to unhealthy food marketing. And therefore, it has not protected them effectively from the harm that such marketing causes. As we've heard, rights-based approaches require that states, the duty bearers, or the EU as an entity that has been attributed specific powers by its member states, should regulate third parties, including the food and the ad tech industries that contribute to violations of the rights of children as right holders. This is not optional. This entails a binding obligation, both under the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child and other international human rights instrument, and under the EU treaties and the EU Charter on Fundamental Rights and Freedoms. And this is why the wording of the EU Children's Rights Strategy of 2021 is so disappointing. It is merely calling on the EU to, quote, develop best practices and a voluntary code of conduct to reduce online marketing to children of unhealthy food. The inadequacy of the EU pledge and its many loopholes will provide the focus of Neleke's presentation just after mine. But the point is clear. Legislative reforms must be driven by evidence, not by a dogmatic misplaced belief in self-regulation. The EU must adopt legally binding rules protecting children from exposure to all forms of cross-border unhealthy food marketing, ensuring that their best interests are indeed upheld as a primary consideration. Next slide, please. So to provide support to the EU so that it can at long last up its game, we have drafted a model directive. This directive is intended as an advocacy tool to show that it is perfectly feasible for the EU to reconcile its discourse with its action. Nothing prevents the EU from effectively regulating the marketing of food to protect children from its harmful impact. In fact, it must. So when we started drafting this directive, we kept three key points in mind. Firstly, we consider that the regulation of food marketing should be entrusted to the Directorate General of the European uh, Commission, sorry, responsible for health, DG Santé. It is particularly important, bearing in mind the failure of DG Connect over the years to engage meaningfully with existing evidence. A failure that I would personally characterize as nothing short of a stubborn refusal. And I deeply regret it. Secondly, we are acutely aware that the European Union only has conferred powers or attributed competence. The EU cannot regulate all food marketing. It can only regulate cross-border food marketing. Therefore, the directive primary, primarily focuses on broadcast media, digital media, publications in, in print, uh, sponsorship with cross-border effects and product packaging. 
By contrast, static advertising, for example, does not fall within the scope of this directive, nor does sponsorship that has no cross-border effect. In other words, we have adopted as comprehensive an approach as possible within the limits set by the EU treaties. The EU cannot do everything, and we acknowledge it, but it can do a lot. And thirdly, we have ensured that the proposals we have made are compliant with the principle of proportionality. We have reflected on the legitimacy of these proposals and their necessity. And we have concluded that no alternative measure can achieve the objective pursued as effectively as the ones we have proposed. Once again, only wide-ranging marketing restrictions are likely to protect children from the harmful impact that unhealthy food marketing has on their health and on their rights. Next slide, please. I will use the last few minutes of my presentation to highlight six key elements of the directive, but I warmly uh, invite you to read the directive once it is uh, published uh, later on today and engage with us as Nikolai has suggested in a dialogue. So firstly, we are calling on the EU to end the marketing of unhealthy food between 6 a.m and 11 p.m. on broadcast media, both television and radio. And the reason why we've chosen this watershed, these time slots, it is because the EU conducted a, uh, um, a, a study uh, led by ECORIS, uh, published in 2016, that showed that children were exposed to uh, alcohol advertising uh, and watched television between these hours of 6 a.m. and 11 p.m. So the idea is, if you really want to curb children's exposure to unhealthy food marketing, you need to ban such marketing in the hours where they can be expected to uh, be in front of their screens or listening to the radio. Secondly, we are calling on a ban on the marketing of unhealthy food on digital media. And the reason for a complete ban of unhealthy food on digital media is because it, a watershed is not uh, easy to implement, if at all uh, possible to implement on digital media, firstly. And secondly, there is a massive uncertainty as to uh, the extent to which children are exposed online, we know that they are exposed to an awful lot of food marketing in digital media, but such a marketing is uh, very difficult to quantify, as uh, some of my colleagues have uh, shown, uh, and in particular, I will refer you to the paper that uh, Mimi Tatlov golden and Dan Parker have written uh, on the impact assessment that the UK conducted when it uh, proposed to implement a watershed on uh, unhealthy food marketing in uh, online in the UK. Thirdly, I uh, will highlight that we are proposing to deal with brand marketing, and we're calling on the EU to end the sponsorship by food brands of events with cross-border effects. The only uh, caveat, there are two. Uh, firstly, brands could prove that such sponsorship is not associated with unhealthy food, in which case they could proceed with uh, their sponsorship. And secondly, we have excluded from the uh, pro prohibition uh, events that are events for uh, adults only, the presumption being here, of course, that no child should be in attendance. Fourthly, we would like to go uh, far beyond uh, the uh, media that are covered by the audiovisual media services directive, and we would like the EU to recognize that the use of marketing techniques appealing to children is uh, very extensive and damaging to children, particularly on food packaging. And bearing in mind food products move extensively from one member state to the other, we would like the EU to regulate uh, the use of these techniques 
on food packaging in particular. Um, fifth, uh, a child should be defined in line with the UN Convention on the Rights of a Child and uh, the EU strategy on the rights of a child as any person below the age of 18. Not only young children, but also teenagers are harmed by unhealthy food marketing, and this needs to be recognized in the EU regulatory framework in line with existing evidence. And finally, uh, we would call on the EU to uh, determine what falls within the definition of unhealthy food uh, using the WHO European Nutrient Profiling Model, uh, a model that is increasingly well accepted, uh, that is free from industry's interference, objective and independent, and therefore fit for purpose. So to conclude, uh, and next slide, please. Uh, I will repeat that the proposed directive is based on an in-depth engagement over the years with existing research on the harm stemming from unhealthy food marketing and research on the limits of self-regulation. The EU should certainly have acted long ago, but its lack of political will over the last 15 years is not a fatality. It can change course. Even before its launch today, this proposed directive has gathered ample support from a diverse group of civil society organizations. 20 are listed on this slide. It has gathered support from several MEPs. It has gathered support from academia. And it has gathered support from children themselves. So we will hear from them all later on but these voices can no longer be ignored. So this leaves me to thank you very much for your attention and more importantly, for your ongoing support. Thank, thank you so much, Amadine. And thank you for all your support to uh, this um, amazing work and also for being so clear and to the point as always, not turning around the issues straight, straight on. And I think, yeah, the, the directive is really showing, in a way, the inconvenient truth that, at least legally speaking, uh, regulating marketing is actually not at all that difficult. Uh, only the lack of willingness has been uh, standing in the way so far, but I think we'll be working on that. Um, now, uh, conscious of time and seeing some um, questions that have come in, we're turning to the next speaker, Nelleke Polderman um, from Berg, European Consumer Organizations. Um, and well, which we, we will have a who will have a fantastic story to tell about one of the uh, most well-known uh, self-regulatory initiatives uh, in the European space on marketing. And despite it having a very well-polished appearance, uh, well, we will hear what, what the reality is of this initiative. Thanks, uh, Nelika. Well, thank you, Nikolai, for uh, for inviting us to to present our uh, our latest project on uh, um, on the EU pledge and the limitations of self self regulation. Um, we we've been working on this project with ten of our national consumer organizations, ten of our members, and a group of scientists, including uh, Professor Amandine Garden that you just heard. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and before we go into the details, I'd like to, to take you to the, the, uh, a day in the life of a, of a kid. So we're going to watch a short video.
So this was, of course, uh, artist impression of how it uh, it could be for a, for a certain child. We go to the next slide. We go back to reality. Unfortunately, uh, there are still, uh, as we heard from the previous speakers, um, children are bombarded with uh, advertisements for, for unhealthy food. And these are just a few examples that uh, we came across at the beginning of this year. And I just want to highlight one of, uh, of the examples. It's the one on the bottom of the slide. It's the, the Prince uh, product. And this was a promotional campaign in Belgium where uh, consumers were invited to buy four packages of the cookies. And that would allow them to create their own Prince mascot, which is obviously very attractive to children. And you had to buy four packages. So it encouraged you to eat the cookies. Next slide, please. So what we did was we, we collected examples and we brought them to the EU pledge. This is, it has been talked uh, about before, but this is a, a voluntary initiative by, by some of the, of the bigger um, European food and drink companies and has been around uh, since 2007 already. And um, since, uh, since three years, there's also accountability mechanism where you can, you can bring your complaints if you, if you think there's a breach of the, of the pledge commitments. So that's what we did. Uh, next slide, please. So in total, we submitted 81 complaints to, uh, to the EU pledge. And the results are that seven out of them were withdrawn by the companies themselves, once confronted with, uh, with our complaints. Um, eight of them, um, we, the complaints were upheld. So after uh, the procedure, the panel concluded that indeed these were uh, breaches of the EU pledge, the, the commitments of the companies. And in three cases, that was only after we, we appealed. But it leaves us to the conclusion that in more than 80% of the cases, um, the, the ad advertisements got, uh, got unaffected, which is, uh, which is very unfortunate. Uh, next slide, please. We so what's happening? Well, we came across um, some flaws of the of the EU pledge as we as we name them. Um, we've heard a, a little bit about about them before already. What what we found is that uh, briefly the the nutritional criteria are, are too weak. Um, the commitments only affect part of the TV because they only affect really the programs where only children are watching, and we we already heard they're watching a lot more. Um, Digital marketing is not sufficiently addressed uh, and neither is, uh, is food packaging where we see lots of uh, images that some of the speakers before also uh, were talking about. Teenagers are not protected by the EU pledge commitments and there's also a loophole for brand marketing. So as long as you don't show the unhealthy uh, products of your brand, you can still go, go along with, uh, with advertisements. So next slide, please. Secondly, apart from the, from the content, we also came across um, um, some, some failures of the accountability mechanism itself. According to us, it, it proved inadequate. First of all, it's, it's too slow. In, in our experience, it took us at least several months to get a complaint through. And in some cases, it even took more than half a year. So that means that uh, the, the, the consequences for the infringing company they're minimal because those kind of promotional campaigns they are, are only running for a couple of or weeks or, or months and not, not for years in the, in, in, in the run. We also observed a, a lack of transparency. Um, so not all complaints that we uh, submitted were, were published on the, on the EU pledge website, which we, we think is not, uh, it should be, it's not a good thing. Uh, and then also we, we observed um, um, that the panel decisions, they, they, they're not good enough. We, they seem to favor companies on, on very weak grounds and they also appear to be inconsistent, which uh, brings me to, to our conclusions. Um, well, as we heard before, self-regulation clearly fails uh, to prevent the marketing of unhealthy foods to children. It has been shown once again, unfortunately. And binding EU rules are, are very necessary. So BERG, the European Consumer Organization, is very happy to be part of this call to action. If you want to know more about our research, you can find it by, uh, by following the link that's on the, on the screen. And uh, I'd like to thank you for, for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Nelika. And, and really, thanks a lot for uh, this research you, you did, which is really very well done. And it uh, really helps break some of the 
mythology about this specific initiative and it's kind of adding to the evidence uh, in this space, I would say. Yeah. I'm really happy we have um, 10 minutes now for, uh, for questions and, and further discussion. Thanks a lot for keeping to your time uh, because that's re really important, especially in this event. So if you could, uh, for, for the speaker, just to, to turn on um, your cameras. And I have uh, noted a few questions that have come through the chat. Maybe I just need to uh, respond to one um, which refers to um, having other opinions on board uh, here during the event. Um, well, I think, as I said before, we're only just beginning uh, in a way. And these discussions you, you refer to, they, they're all, um, they will be coming up and uh, there will be also uh, reflections, um, a, a wider range of reflections indeed. I think today's day was really to um to frame the to, to frame the discussion to frame the initiative um uh, that that we are launching today and to bring people on board who are um who are there to to, to provide the evidence uh, for that and further discussions and deliberations are coming and they uh, will really be coming your way indeed so um of the questions that, that we noted, maybe uh, there's, there was a first one, um, and I guess for, for, for everyone in a way, um, the, um, uh, so Spain has been recently uh, in the news for uh, wanting to introduce uh, national law restricting in, in quite a comprehensive way, uh, unhealthy food marketing. And the question is, are there other examples within EU member states uh, that's either regulating in this way or moving in this direction that you know about? Um, maybe, I, I'm not sure whoever wants to answer. Uh, I know, Amandine, you've done an overview of uh, leg legislation in, the, in, in Europe at some point. Uh, Nadeke, maybe you've been following this for, for Europe also specifically. Joe may be better placed to, to respond, but I think the, the bottom line is the EU is exchange wants uh, states to exchange best practice, but we, we don't really have much best practice to share that uh, reflect the comprehensive approaches that we would like to see. Uh, so there are states that have taken some measures. If we focus on EU member states, uh, unfortunately, the UK, as we know, uh, has left the EU, but it's probably one of the states uh, in Europe, at least the WHO uh, Euro region, that has uh, that is doing the most to restrict the marketing of unhealthy food to children. Uh, the UK has uh, not only uh, is planning to adopt a watershed uh, up to 9 p.m. in the evening. Uh, on uh, television, but has also proposed, uh, is in the process of reflecting on a uh, complete ban on unhealthy food marketing. So this is also what's inspired this directive, uh, the amount of work that was done by the UK to show that the watershed would not be uh, feasible online and therefore that the best option, a precautionary approach to protect children from exposure would be a complete ban of unhealthy food marketing online. And at national level and local level, you also have measures to complement what could be uh, EU measures in this ideal world we are hoping for, uh, restrictions on display at points of sale, uh, restrictions in uh, public transport in certain cities, uh, London, Bristol, et cetera, et cetera. So the question for us is really to reflect on how the EU, should it finally have this political will, could work with member states to ensure the comprehensive approach that Joe has um, uh, described. Thanks, Amandine. Um, now look at Joe, do, do you have anything to add to this? I guess just to add that, um the news from Spain about their plans to introduce the regulation is of course really welcome um, and particularly the recognition that the ne they need to introduce this regulation because their previous existing self-regulatory policy hasn't been achieving what they intended it to do and that coming from a government is a very you know well um, uh, well received uh, statement that we recognize that we need to regulate this. Um, I would also like to sort of um, pick up on the point that you you started the discussion with Nikolai around the you know including um food industry in the conversation um because they want to be part of the discussion I mean I, I, I do think part of the approach that we were describing was recognizing that this does need to be government-led 
um, depending on the level of government, so whether that's at the European Union level or whether it's at the national level or city level, as Amandine was saying, this is something that should be um, uh, you know, led by the government. Their intent should be clear from the start. They should set the policy objectives and uh, ideally they should set from the outset that this is going to be a regulatory approach, given the years of evidence that we now have that that is the best approach. And I, I would... Um, that is an important consideration. It shouldn't just be everybody is equal at the table around this. It's important that government sets the parameters for the conversation and, of course, then consults at a certain point, like through good um, due process and good consultation process, but it's not as part of the decision making process. At least that's what the evidence um, would suggest. Thanks, Joe. Uh, Nalika, anything to add specific? Yeah, maybe just to add that um, also we. Our, our Spanish member also very, very was, was very happy on the on the Spanish move by the by the Ministry of, of, of Consumption, of course. Uh, there's still it's still not perfect, but it's uh, it's a move in the right direction. And uh, apart from the UK, that was already mentioned, we know that Portugal has taken some some measures as well on the on the minimal on the, on, the, on the smaller level. So that's uh, there's still uh, room for a lot of improvement, indeed. Thank you. Um, I'm just turning quickly to, to, to a topic that came up quite a few times. Um, so how would you see this specific um, initiative relating to the whole issue of breast milk uh, substitutes, uh, which has been brought up? Because in principle, it does not directly cover it, but how, how, how does, do you see the interrelation uh, between? I can jump in first from a sort of issue thematic um, perspective, and perhaps then Amandine can comment at it from a legal um, perspective, but of course, as I, I answered one, one of the colleagues in the chat, um, absolutely, that is an important part. And when we talk as UNICEF um, around, um, uh, you know, sort of um, ending the harmful impact of marketing on children, that of course covers uh, marketing that is to caregivers um, that then has a negative impact on, on children, including breast milk substitutes, um, uh, co commercial complementary foods that would undermine exclusive breastfeeding practices that WHO and UNICEF recommend. Um, there are, I know there are uh, examples of countries that are looking at um, combining them and in, you know, having uh, a, a single uh, regulatory approach to um, address all forms of harmful marketing that has a negative impact on children. Um, but then, of course, you need to look at the specific legal context and whether you know there it makes sense. Um, for sure, we want um, European countries to do better in terms of um, complying with the code in full. Um, but I would uh, leave it to Amandine to look at the regulatory approach and why, for example, the directive that is being proposed today has chosen to focus on um, unhealthy food. Yes, this is an excellent question. Thank you very much for uh, for raising it. Um, the, the objective of the directive is to protect children uh, from uh, the forms of marketing to them. Uh, breast milk substitute marketing is primarily uh, to mothers or mothers to be. So the idea, the underpinning rationale was very much to implement the WHO recommendations of 2010 in the EU. Why have we done that? We've gone around different phases in, in, in the drafting process. And you could ask, why are we not dealing with harmful commodities more broadly? Uh, there were questions around alcohol as well that uh, were raised and whether we should include uh, alcohol marketing. I think the idea was that there was sufficient political will and support for this specific issue. So my, I, I do agree that we need more integration in some respects to promote healthier food environments and therefore uh, BMS marketing should be addressed by the EU. That's also long overdue. The code should be effectively implemented, et cetera, et cetera. But for uh, this initiative, we've decided to focus on something a bit narrower that uh, would allow perhaps to get the momentum going around the marketing of harmful commodities. What I'm saying is we can draft up the directives if this one flies. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot for that. And I, I think we have time for one quick question because I, I don't want to take away time from the uh, second part of this discussion, which is also really going to be exciting. And I, I guess, well, there are good questions really ar around definition of, uh, of healthy food, um, uh, around 
um, yeah, EU versus national level, etc. But maybe one general uh, comment or one quick thought from from each uh, about what feeling do you have um, on COVID now with uh, with what's ha happening? Is it actually, in a way, um, will it move us forward as this? As, as the question uh, asks, forward or backward in terms of protecting children from uh, this unhealthy food marketing? Do you have any experience or uh, thoughts or any, yeah, in, oh, something that has gathered, any evidence that has been gathered on this over the, the last period, really? I mean, I can jump in quickly just to summarize, you know, I think there is uh, studies that have shown that, uh, that children are reporting um, being more highly exposed to food marketing during the COVID um, pandemic of, uh, you know, that perhaps on their devices more, um, but also I think there have been uh, examples of specific campaigns um, that have, have uh, you know, targeted children uh, over this period. And um, UNICEF in a number of countries around the world has a platform um, called your report which is is children you know self-report and answer polls and a number of them including in in latin america have reported um yeah that children feel that they're seeing more marketing uh, for foods over this period so um from a problem perspective i think it's unfortunately got worse um of course i think um the the, the covid pandemic has highlighted the links between um overweight and obesity and, and worse outcomes um uh, and you know Therefore, you know, overweight and obesity in some contexts has, has again come onto the political agenda. So that could be an opportunity, um, but hard to predict um, whether it will ultimately be uh, helpful or um, a barrier for us, um, given all the other um, consequences of COVID. Um, but keen to hear what other people think. I think, if I may add, that uh, uh, during the, the COVID pandemic, we've seen at least two things. On the one hand, of course, children are have been more exposed to digital media, uh, and uh, the, the food industry has, I think, capitalized on certain themes. You know, uh, boredom, comfort eating, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And at the same time, uh, you see the um, uh, yeah, that, that's what I, I will stop here. But uh, it seems to me that there has been a capitalization, if you like, uh, of the extra time that children has, have spent online. And of course, that means more data gathered, analyzed for uh, uh, analytics, and therefore the likelihood that uh, advertising before becomes more personalized, more targeting, targeted and potentially more effective. Thank you. Uh, Nelika, any, uh, any feedback from your members? Yeah, we also saw that the, the, the this time on screens is, is increasing. This, I mean, our, our study was being done at uh, during a, a lockdown time in many countries. So we really see that the, the need is even go, uh, gone uh, gone bigger. Yeah. So let's hope that uh, it will will be taken into action. Yeah, definitely, and uh, I think that that's what we we're, we're all here to to try to uh, to, to bring to bring the, to bring this action forward. So. Uh, thank you so much um, for being here, for uh, engaging with some of the questions. I, I see there's many more, but uh, again, as I said, um, please keep them coming in. Um, this is not the end of the discussion. We are kind of coming, launching, launching this now, and there's, there's going to be lots of follow-up, and uh, we are listening and taking uh, into account what, what, what you are saying, and we'll be reflecting further on that. Um, but next, we move to the second uh, section of um, the event, um, where uh, mostly um, organizations supporting the initiatives uh, are gathered. Um, and essentially, uh, the, uh, th there will be one question that is going to be answered by everyone, but from their own uh, societal perspective. And the question is a very straightforward and simple one in a way. Why is tackling unhealthy food marketing so important for you? So, and first we will hear uh, from Manuela Ripa, member of European Parliament, but also a parent who has come across the issue of marketing uh, more than once, both uh, in her political and private life. So please, Ma Manuela, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Nikolai. 
Uh, thanks very much for inviting me. And let me start directly with an example why in my view it is paramount to protect children, but also parents from marketing of unhealthy food. The other day I was with my child in the supermarket. Every parent knows the situation. Little time to do the grocery shopping and the child always wanting something. This time it was ice cream. My child indicated me one. On the front package of this ice cream, there was a lion holding the ice cream and a nice label of the producer stating in bold letters that this product was responsibly made for kids. Well, I was in a hurry and this product was responsibly made for kids. So it would be an easy thing to just buy it immediately. Unfortunately for this company, I always read the back of the package and especially the ingredients list. There I saw that this product responsibly made for kids was made amongst others out of six different sugars. And worst thing, on the backside, the producing company explained that this ice cream meets their nutrition criteria for children. Six sugars meet their nutrition criteria for children, unbelievable. And that is why I'm really happy for your initiative and this event to stop this kind of misguidance of consumers, in this case of parents. This past year showed that voluntary agreements by the nutrition industry did not work at all. My just mentioned example is the very proof of it. So it is high time to regulate the sector. We had the same with other EU legislations when voluntary agreements led to nothing. Just take as an example the mobile chargers. After many years of leaving it to the industry to come up with just one charger, which they didn't, the commission is now proposing a directive. Shouldn't the health of our children be more important than a charger? Sorry that I have to be polemic here, but it is not for me, it is for me not understandable that is still allowed to lure children and teenagers into unhealthy products, to let them become addicted to sugar, which is detrimental for their health by using celebrities or below, beloved cartoon characters. As a member of the Special Committee on Cancer, I had a lot of hearings on the causes of cancer through unhealthy products and of the association between childhood obesity and cancer risks later in life. Regarding the reduction of sugar in products, another important topic apart from marketing of unhealthy food, there are some member states that do already have laws, but we need consumers and especially child protection throughout the EU. I have to say it very clearly, rather than supporting marketing strategies of the food industry and helping them like this to sell better their products, politicians should help consumers to make informed choices and protect especially children from harmful carcinogenic substances. This requires a change of legislation soon. And until this legislation uh, change comes into force, we need a clear EU-wide label system. Children and their parents deserve clear labeling to make an informed decision on which product to choose without having completed a chemistry degree. Children in particular must be protected. Therefore, I'm very happy that today you are launching this initiative that I fully support. I hope that this will motivate other policymakers to recognize this issue and to move the legislative process forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Manuela. A really strong personal perspective. And I, and I think it could become a tagline for this initiative, really, like what's important, a charger or a child? Uh, very well said. And I think it also really a little bit reflecting on some of the questions. Actually, protecting children is, is a protection for parents uh, as well in many cases, because there will be less inclination to, to do either what your, your, your kids are demanding from you or to think in terms of, oh, this is what they will love because you have these, these nice uh, kind of uh, uh, cartoon characters on them while, while it actually not being uh, great products at all. Thank you so much. And we really look forward to work with you uh, on this. Next um, is Patrick O'Sullivan, a doctor representing the Standing Committee of European Doctors here in, Bru in Brussels. Please, Patrick, the floor is yours. Nikolai, uh, thank you for that introduction and thank you for this opportunity to support this call to action. I, as Nikolai said, I, I, I am a doctor, I actually retired now, but I also chair the Healthy Living Working Group 
of the CPME, the Standing Committee of European Doctors. As doctors, we frequently end up treating the health problems that arise from unhealthy, unhealthy lifestyle choices. The focus of the working group I chair is on trying to prevent people becoming unwell in the first place by encouraging them to adopt healthier lifestyles. However, promoting healthy life, healthy living cannot just be the responsibility of the health sector alone. It requires a multi-sectoral approach to ensure that people are able to live as healthy lives as possible. If we can promote healthy lifestyles, we can reduce the burden of non-communicable diseases and the resulting chronic diseases and premature deaths that occur in the population. Obesity is one of those health problems that can result from lifestyle choices and which requires a multi-sectoral approach to try and combat it. Levels of overweight and obesity are unfortunately increasing in the population throughout Europe at this time. Uh, the problem may begin in childhood and obese children frequently go on to become obese adults with the associated increased risks, as we've heard, of non-communicable diseases such as cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes and some cancers. Depending on the country, up to one in five or more children may now be overweight or obese and there is a social gradient in that obesity. With more children in the lower income families being overweight or obese, in part at least, this is a result of the marketing of unhealthy foods, which less educated, less, less well off families may be more vulnerable to. Tackling obesity needs a multi sectoral and multi pronged strategy promoting healthier diets, regulating the promotion of unhealthy foods particularly to children, making sure that the healthier choices of foods are available and affordable, and encouraging adequate exercise for all. Certainly reducing the exposure of our children to the marketing of unhealthy foods has to be part of that strategy. The evidence is clear, food marketing affects what children eat and ultimately their health and well-being. Reducing the exposure of children to that food marketing, particularly of unhealthy foods, is one way to reduce the numbers that are becoming overweight or obese. This is something that CPME would strongly support and encourage, and we strongly support this call to action. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Patrick. And it, it's really critical to have uh, the, the doctors and the, the medical professionals voice here. And indeed, as you say, it shouldn't be for doctors alone to help people's health, but it's really society should be designed in this way appropriately. And marketing is a, is a major component of this. Thank you so much. Next is uh, Sibyl uh, Reichert from the International Association of Mutual Benefit Societies, or in other words, representing those who actually pay for healthcare. Sibyl. Thank you very much, uh, Nikolai. Thanks a lot uh, for this initiative and inviting uh, AIM uh, to be part of that. Uh, and good afternoon, everyone. So AIM, as Nikolai said, um, represents a solidarity-based not-for-profit statutory and complementary health insurers. And our members are, as he said, actually the ones that pay for healthcare. So for us, the initiative and the blueprint of the directive launched today are both timely and of most importance. As Dr. Sullivan, or Sullivan has already mentioned, the public health risks with raising rates of obesity and chronic, or chronic diseases are really uh, an important aspect. And of course, marketing and as a consequence, bad eating habits are not the only determinant of childhood obesity. However, the WHO itself recognizes the direct link between childhood obesity and overweight and the marketing of unhealthy foods and drinks. We think that there's a clear need to ta take bold action. If we take the example of France only, in 2018, irrespective of the medium, advertisements for Nutri-Score D and E products accounted for more than half of the advertisements seen on television by children and adolescents. To tackle childhood obesity, all risk factors need to be addressed. And I think that has been mentioned already. So creating more sustainable and healthier food environments are part of a comprehensive strategy and marketing of unhealthy food for children is a key element in that environment. 
As health insurers, our task is to provide access to healthcare for all without inequalities. But at the same time, we are also responsibility for the sustainability of our healthcare systems, a sustainability that is under threat for various reasons. Unhealthy food systems and unhealthy marketing that trigger unhealthy food behavior, that trigger obesity and chronic diseases, put our solidarity-based systems under greater pressure due to the rising costs for the treatment of such chronic conditions. The extent, uh, the extent to which our healthcare systems will be threatened depends certainly on the action that we take today. The joint European Commission and uh, um, EPC aging report published this year projects public expenditure of health and long-term care systems on basis of different scenarios. The best case scenario can only be achieved if a health in all policy approach is followed. One that acts on all determinants of health from the moment of birth until our death. Disease prevention and health promotion are high on our agendas. Food systems and nutrition are a clear determinant to fight disease at all ages. Marketing is a key aspect, especially for the impact it has on younger generations and on future older ones. Our children are the most vulnerable and it's our task to protect them and make sure they get the food that is good for their health and development. For all those reasons, AIM is convinced that the EU should take advantage of the political momentum to put forward a concrete legislative proposal like the one we, have, we are presenting today. Since the pandemic, the whole EU narrative on health has changed. It is and has become a clear priority. Developments such as the Farm to Fork, the Cancer Plan, or the Framework for Sustainable Food Systems are windows of opportunity to make a health in all policies approach a reality. We support the Parliament's call for a clear action on marketing. Um, and um, so um, finally, evidence is there and political will is building. So let us not have this public health threat unattended. Let's all act together. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much uh, for Sibyl, uh, Sibyl also for the powerful message. Uh, sustainable, the sustainability of healthcare systems actually depend on the actions taken today. Um, and marketing is clearly one important aspect of it. And this comes from essentially people on the front line of underpinning the, the functioning of health systems. So I think this is really something that, that should be listened to. Thank you so much. Uh, next is Professor Shira Zelbersagi, uh, representing uh, two organizations here, the European Association for the Study of the Liver, ESL, and United European Gastroenterology. Really looking forward to your insights. Thank you very much, Nikolai, and I'm so happy to take part in this uh, important uh, initiative. Um, I speak on behalf of two medical and scientific associations, so I would like to devote a few minutes to the scientific background that actually supports uh, the policy measures that we suggest here. So ultra-processed food consumption is actually increasing globally, and it comprises about 50 to 60% of the calories per day in many countries. And the highest consumers of ultra-processed foods in many countries are in fact children and adolescents. So like half of the calories consumed per day come from ultra-processed foods among children and adolescents in many countries. Ultra-processed foods are really far in their dietary composition from the original foods they were made of. So these are actually formulations of food substances modified by chemical uh, processes by the food industry. And you would find their ingredients that you won't find in your own kitchen. So there are ingredients that are used only by the food industry. And in fact, these foods are designed to be highly profitable because they are low cost products, ready to eat and highly palatable products. So they are designed to encourage eating. Indeed, many uh, epidemiological studies and clinical trials have shown an association between consumption of ultra processed foods and increased risk of cancer, cardiovascular disease, type two diabetes, obesity, weight gain among uh, adults and uh, children, and also an association with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which is the most prevalent liver disease in globally and in Europe. So there is no doubt that we should try to reduce the consumption of ultra-processed food. Interestingly, when we think about food insecurity, 
we tend to think that it's the inability to buy food, but in fact, this is the inability to buy healthy food because healthy food is far more expensive than the ultra processed food. And maybe not surprisingly, we see that the prevalence of fatty liver disease and liver damage is higher among families with food insecurity. So those who, are, who get the worst uh, uh, harmful effect of high consumption of ultra processed food are those with food insecurity. And the damage of unhealthy foods starts from childhood. We need to remember that. And one of the most uh, important components of ultra processed food is sugared beverages. So 16% of the children and adolescents in Europe consume sugar beverages on a daily basis. And it has been shown to be associated with liver disease and of course other diseases and obesity and weight gain. For example, infants in the year of one age who consume two uh, sugar beverages per day will have threefold increased risk of developing liver disease at the age of 10 years old. The good news that if we reduce ultra processed food and sugar consumption in the diet, we do see improved uh, uh, health among those children. So we do need, so we do need to support these initiatives. And uh, so the, the uh, EZEL and the UEG would like to support uh, this initiative and we recommend public health policies to restrict advertising and marketing to children of sugar sweetened beverages and highly processed foods, high in saturated fat, sugar, and salt. In parallel, we recommend uh, health education programs which emphasize the benefits of uh, unprocessed foods, especially Mediterranean uh, diet, which actually consists of unprocessed or minimally processed uh, foods, uh, and to promote water consumption instead of sugar sweetened beverages. We believe that food and beverage beverages manufacturers have social responsibility to protect the health of their consumers, especially children. And they, they are actually uh, responsible to put um, clear uh, food labeling to make sure that the consumer understand what they buy and what they eat. And um, uh, they have the responsibility to reformulate the foods to be healthier. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Shira, for this uh, scientific uh, background on the, the role of ultra processed food and, and which are indeed, uh, as you said, the products which are most marketed actually. So this would really contribute to, to the causes that you highlighted. Uh, quickly next, Catherine Riley, uh, Irish Heart Foundation and European Heart Network at the same time. Um, very much engaged in health advocacy in Ireland and especially on issues of child marketing. Please, uh, Catherine. Hi, everybody. Um, I suppose just to kick off. So, despite decades of, of evidence based civil society advocacy, you know, we believe the EU has missed countless opportunities to effectively reduce the harmful impacts nutritionally poor food marketing has on children. And we believe you know, the, the latest amendment of the AVMSD is a clear example of this. So, as both a representative of the European Heart Network and the Irish Heart Foundation here today, I have to point out there is a long-standing track record of working advocacy um, to, to reduce marketing of, of healthy foods to children from both organisations. And to answer Nicolai's question on why tackling food marketing is so important, um, our advocacy work is underpinned because of the need to reduce childhood obesity and reduce the growth in the obesogenic environment. And you know, we see that health services are firefighting the health impacts of chronic disease without meaningfully addressing many of the root causes. So we do need to take that step back and look at food marketing and comprehensively address it. And, just to put the extent of our advocacy in this area into, concept, into context, you know, the discussions started way back when, when the Television Life Frontiers Directive um, was discussed. Um, it was revised in 97, so subsequently moved on to the Audiovisual Media Service Directive adopted in 2010. Its revision then adopted in 2018. And those consistent asks of health and consumer NGOs throughout these processes were those asks that we have here today in the directive and the asks that, that the European organizations are, are asking for here today, you know, the, the, the watershed of marketing and the, the no sponsorship, the development of nutrient profiles, regulation that's not self-regulation by the industry, and regulation of online marketing to children. And, and these asks, and it's really important to highlight again, as we all know, they're underpinned by concrete and robust evidence that 
you know, the European Heart Network, together with other health NGOs, were brought together, for example, in the project, The Marketing of Unhealthy Foods to Children, you know, that, that, that publication dates back to 2005. And, you know, 30 years later from the, you know, the television led Frontiers directive, you know, these acts still stand, they're as relevant as they had been. And, and that's why we're so supportive of the draft, draft directive that's presented here today. Um, some speakers mentioned earlier, you know, there is a trend towards more food marketing restrictions at, at member state level to fight, fight childhood obesity. It's coming to the fore now. And in Ireland, the Irish Heart Foundation, and following our advocacy work over recent years through our Stop Targeting Kids campaign, um, our legislators in the parliamentary committee discussing online safety and media regulation. Um, and incident, incidentally, that's the bill, it's a bill um, that's actually going to transpose the audiovisual media service directive. But in pre legislative scrutiny, a parliamentary committee um, only last week recommended and called for a ban on this type of marketing, as well as actually going so far as to recommending the self-regulation or other non-statutory mechanisms are not included as part of the advertising regulatory framework. Um, and you know, that's, that this is the second parliamentary report in, in three years in Ireland to make these recommendations. So it is a huge step. And this follows on from um, 2018 work that we did on, on data protection legislation to stop profiling targets of children and a 2020 commitment in our program for government for legislation and um, public health obesity bill to include restrictions on the marketing of unhealthy foods to children. So we are seeing, as I said, that national trend to more, towards more food marketing restrictions um, driven by those decades of, of advocacy and evidence. And again, it's critical to highlight that it's evidence-based, all this advocacy. Um, however, you know, the, the, the ubiquitous and relentless promotion of snacks, sweets, fast food, confectionery to children, it is becoming greater every, every day. And given that, given that, that unhealthy um, marketing or marketing of unhealthy foods to children is remains at problematic levels, and um, we believe that national and EU legislative actions and interventions are necessary to drive public policy to address um, the health harms caused by this marketing. So while we are making these strides at national level in terms of legislation, what is needed is action at European level and um, to underpin better these national policies and, and regulations. And you know, that's why we um, are supporting this, this directive because um, we need to go a lot further than the revised audio visual media service directive. Thank you so much, Catherine. Uh, and indeed, I think this, this national EU interaction is really critical. And it, it's really about the question how the EU can support the national level in doing what it can at a European level. And now last, but, but actually first in many ways, uh, Tasha Makayakora from uh, Bite Back 2030, really passionate about empowering young people and hugely important also in the push to advance child marketing on the UK policy agenda, which has met considerable success as far as I know. So please, Tasha, your words. Thank you so much, Nikolai, for that introduction. And good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank the European Public Health Alliance for inviting me to take part in, in this really important conversation. Um, adding on to that introduction, so I am a former co-chair and now trustee at Back Back 2030. We are a youth-led campaigning organization that's on a mission to protect child health and half childhood obesity by 2030. And today I'll be talking about the way in which children are bombarded with junk food adverts across all digital platforms, as well as the use of sponsorships, particularly um, within the sports industry and how that shapes young people and children's food choices and what we ultimately consume. Um, so firstly, on digital marketing. So adver online advertising, we know it works. Otherwise, why would companies, uh, junk food companies spend millions if it doesn't, right? And according to an expose conducted by Bite Back 2030, children and young people in the UK, they see nearly 500 junk food adverts per second online and so that is we also know that five of the most children youtubers have made videos featuring unhealthy food brands such as junk food ads that have been viewed more than one billion times and we know that young people and children are incredibly impress impressionable we are vulnerable and so this advertising is manipulating young people like myself and those that are even younger than i to crave more pester our parents and amande um, gave an incredible uh, antidote about her experience with her child in the food uh, in the supermarket so we know the power of pester power uh, that encourages us to buy more and ultimately eat more unhealthy food 
And so we also know that this year, the UK government announced a ban on junk food advertising online before 9pm um, on TV from the year 2030 as part of uh, Boris's pledge to tackle the UK's growing obesity crisis. And I believe that these new measures, um, which will be some of the toughest marketing restrictions in the world, will heavily impact um, more than 600 um, million pounds that is spent on brands who promote advertising online and tv um, annually and i think that switching offline switching off online junk food ads will remove um 12.5 billion calories from my diet and just kind of like visualize what that looks like that looks like a pile of big macs that weigh the same as 470 double decker buses so imagine all of that being reduced uh, taken out of our diets that is going to have incredible impact and on the topic of uh, sponsorships and like i mentioned sports sponsorships we know that sponsors, uh, sponsorships are commonly used to market unhealthy food and and non-alcoholic beverages and this exposes millions of consumers not just children as well but all of us um, to their marketing messages which i'll talk about in just a second some examples so across europe and the rest of the world um, we see various sports clubs associations leagues and clubs continuing to partner with companies that are known for producing high fat salt sugar products okay so for example we know that the fa is sponsored by mcdonald's the champions league is by walkers the Olympics by Coca-Cola, the 100. So if you're a cricket fan, um, that is sponsored by KP Snacks. And for these unhealthy brands, by linking themselves to sports bodies and the notions of being active, moving more, exercising more, these companies are attempting to associate their products with healthy and active lifestyle. But actually, in reality, many of these products contain high amounts of saturated fat, salt and sugar. And so for children, when unhealthy food and drink brands sponsor kids sports programs, or we see it, you know, on our favorite influencers page, or we see it being sponsored online, we are more likely to recognize these brands. We're then more likely to choose these brands in the supermarket and ultimately just view these brands in a more positive light. And so for me, regulating junk food ads goes beyond banning, you know, adverts in traditional forms of media, but also including the new media that is starting to emerge as well and encouraging the the new media that encourages the uh, consumption of these unhealthy food and drinks. But also what's really important for me is to make sure that these policies are implemented at full effect. So despite the fact that Boris uh, earlier this year announced the ban on junk food ads before 9pm, the 100, so a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months maybe, um, we're still able to get away with cricket players uh, running around the uh, the court, uh, the field um, in uni uniformed in different snack packets. So all of them had a different you know packet of crisp on their uniform and so these loopholes are some of the things that we need to make sure that any regulation any policies uh, that are implemented they are able to ta target the issue at hand properly and remove any loopholes that would allow companies to take advantage of and ultimately continue some of the manipulative and bad habits that they've been able to get away with for so many years. So I'm really excited to have this conversation because from a young person's perspective, it's not just about um, young people, you know, it's not just about companies and governments talking about young people, but truly, uh, truly allowing young people's insights and how we experience the food environment to have a forefront in the conversation so thank you so much thank you so much uh tasha and, and what's done in the uk is really an inspiration for this initiative as well so thanks so much for pushing and uh there and having this uh yeah your, your energy put put into it and i think your words about marketing are really precise it is about manipulating uh although <laughs> they'll probably i'll get i'll get some nightmares th tonight about these heaps of big macs you you mentioned but at least uh I'm maybe uh thinking that they're out going to be out of the food supply maybe hopefully that may help um so uh th thank you so much to everyone we've come to the end of the event now a few minutes over time but but still quite good con considering really the um, uh, the, the amazing uh, discussions and, 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 and input and thoughts that have been uh, presented here. And I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I did, and you've come away inspired and ready for action as well. Um, of course, never enough time to dig into all the issues um, that we may have wanted to. Um, but uh, I think consider this event uh, to be a teaser, and you'll be hearing 
more from this coalition because I don't think we do not intend to give up. Um, there's still a long journey to go, but um, I really hope you will join us. Uh, so please reach out to us and we will be, at least for, the, for now, we will be in touch with you uh, for the event materials. And uh, well, I uh, wish you a good end of the day uh, to all of you. And thank you so much for joining.